encouraged to a degree to visit from place to place and see manger scenes and hear certain songs this time of year that talk about the birth of our Lord. I'm glad that people think about Jesus this time of year. <coughs> we don't know when Jesus was born. There's no record in the New Testament of early Christians ever celebrating the birth of our Lord. So as Christians, we do not have a special celebration for the birth of Jesus, but I sure am glad he was born. I'm thankful that the Son of God came into this world. When you look at the four gospel accounts of the life of our Lord, You'll notice that Matthew's record gives the record of the visit of an angel to Joseph in a dream about Mary expecting a child. Mark gives no account of the birth of Jesus. John gives a very different approach to it. And then, of course, Luke gives the discussion of the angel Gabriel with the Virgin Mary. I want you to pause and think for just a moment about how valuable it was for Christ to come into the world. I want you to think about the question, why did my Savior come to earth? Even though a baby cannot save us from our sins, He came as a human being and grew to be a man and finally, as the sinless Son of God gave His life for our sins. But, but who is this? Many of us have studied and know the answer to the question, especially from John's approach to it in John chapter 1, where he talks about the Word being in the beginning. The Word was with God. And then and the Bible says in John chapter 1 that all things were made through Him. The, the word is identified with a masculine pronoun, him. In verse 14, the Bible says in John chapter 1, And the word became flesh. Watch him. And we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father. Jesus was no ordinary baby. The Word had always been in existence. While it's hard for us to, to grasp something or someone always existing, hard to grasp the idea that 
someone will never cease to exist because we live in a time frame, as it were. Genesis 1 marks time as the beginning. One day Jesus will come again and time as we know it will cease because God, I believe it's Deuteronomy chapter 33 about verse 27, He's an eternal God. He's always been, He always will be, and He lives in eternity. The Word became flesh. The Word created us. I think about Jesus. I think about that babe in strips of cloth or swaddling clothes. They laid him in a manger, born to very poor parents, but the finest woman you'll ever read about in Scripture was his mother. And she raised him in Nazareth. There finally came a time when he would begin his ministry at a man named John the Immerser, John the Baptizer, baptized Jesus to fulfill all righteousness. But, but who is this? John would tell us in John chapter 1 about verse 4, in him was life. And the life was the light of men. The source of life and light was in the Word that became flesh. So in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then you read Genesis 2 and verse 7, as God formed man of the dust of the ground, he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And he became a living being or a living soul. The Word did that. Jesus didn't do that. Jesus became Jesus when he became human. The Word was at work then. Someone made a request of me to write an article about the Word. I'm still working on it. I don't fully grasp all of the ideas or the thoughts of the Word. But I do know that the Word, according to John 1.14, also was full of grace and truth. And in verse 18 of John chapter 1, He revealed the Father to us. Now God's always existed. When Thomas came to see Jesus, he wanted proof that he was a son of God. And he told him, he said, well, just, just put your finger in the print of the nails. Put your hand in my side. And he'd asked the question earlier, you know, when you, he's made the statement, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Jesus was not the Father, but he demonstrated who the Father is, how the Father operates, how he thinks, how he responds to people. The Father did not become human. The Word did. And the Word was the Son of the Father, the Son of God. And we see in verse 29 that that Son who became flesh, John saw Him walking one day. John was giving testimony. John the Immerser, John the Baptist. He was out preaching in the wilderness. And he saw Jesus walking. And he told the people, Look, behold, John 1 29, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. In verse 44 of that same chapter, we see him identified as the Messiah, the anointed one. He's the one whom Moses wrote of in the law and the prophets, Jesus of Nazareth, verse 45, the son of Joseph. Now, to these Jewish people, they waited for the Messiah. When Andrew introduced Jesus, his brother Peter, rather, to Jesus, he says, I want you to tell you something. I found him. I have found the one that Moses wrote about in the prophets. And aren't you thankful to God that Andrew introduced Peter to Jesus? Aren't you glad that somebody introduced you to Jesus? The one who, no, did not stay in a manger, grew up in Nazareth, but then about age 30, he began to preach and to teach and to share the truth of God that man needed for salvation. 
He creates a group of men that he called apostles. While one fell away, he had 11 when he gave the Great Commission, and that one is replaced, Judas is replaced by Matthias in Acts chapter 1, he got 12 again. Jesus prepared men to preach. But you see, he existed, but he existed in glory. The word somehow, whether we grasp it, whether we can wrap our minds around it, according to John chapter 17 and verse 5, that He existed in glory before the world was. Jesus the baby was a human, but the Word became flesh. The eternal Word of God dwelt in a human being. Now, we had an angel come and speak to Joseph in Matthew chapter 1 beginning with verse 18. And the record says, Now the birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother married, had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man, not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph... Son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. No man is responsible for this, Joseph. God is. The Holy Spirit has caused this conception. That made Jesus the God person. The God baby. The God adolescent. Finally, the God-man. No ordinary birth. Let me tell you something, Joseph. She'll bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, one who saves. The Lord saves. For he will save his people from their sins. Jesus was born to save us from our sins. Why did my Savior come to earth? To become the Lamb of God, to bear the sin of the world, to save His people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. We know it was Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, a Hebrew word, which it translated is God with us. God came to visit. Now God had visited over the centuries in different ways through theophanies, that is an appearance. He showed himself to Moses. But not until he became human did God really come to visit people. So when the people met Jesus, they were talking to God. When they heard him speak, they were listening to God. When he died, God in the flesh gave his life. I think about his nature. Genesis 3.15, the seed of woman would eventually come forth and you follow the genealogies all the way down to Mary. Luke's genealogy goes all the way back to Adam. This born, and yet then we have the genealogy of Mary, we have the genealogy of Joseph. There's no question, genealogically speaking, as to whether Jesus was the Messiah who was to come. But he was born of a virgin because God, through the Holy Spirit, caused her to have a child. But why, 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 why did, why did my Savior come to earth? You know, the children of Israel, they lived under the law of Moses. I want to encourage you to write this down and look at Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 through 14, Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, and then you see, especially in Galatians 4, verse 4, that at the right time, Jesus was born under the law. But He came at the right time. He came for a purpose. 
But one of the things that he came to do was what the law could not do. When you read Paul's writings to the church in Galatia, chapters 3 and 4, you'll learn that the law could not save. As a matter of fact, Galatians 3 and verse 24 says it was a tutor, a schoolmaster, to bring us to Christ. It never was intended to be used forever. And all man could do was try to keep the law, but he couldn't keep the law perfectly. He failed miserably. But Jesus kept it perfectly. Matter of fact, Matthew 5 and verse 17, the Lord said, I have not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He not only fulfilled the law and its teaching, but he kept it perfectly. No man could do that. As good a person as Mary was, I promise you she broke, broke it at least once. Paul claimed to have kept the law ceremonial, ceremonially, but Paul was clearly a sinner. 1 Timothy 1.15, he said he was a chief of sinners. Everybody needed a Savior, not only the Jews who could not keep the law, but what about the Gentiles? who sin for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, Romans chapter 3 and verse 23. And the wages of sin for everybody, verse six, chapter 6 and verse 23, is death. Matter of fact, in Romans chapter 2, about verse 18, I believe it is, 3 verse 18, I believe it is, the whole world is guilty before God. I'm glad Jesus was born. Because he came here to save his people from their, from their sins. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 7, the Word of God says, Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But he... Talking about Jesus having been offered, having been offered one sacrifice for sins for all time, sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time onward until his enemies be made a footstool under his feet. For by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. And I think. Those priests, all those years, they would make the sin sacrifices over and over and over and over for centuries. And not one drop or a million drops of animal blood could take away sin. It took the blood of Jesus. Revelation 1 and verse 5 says... He has washed us from our sins in His own blood. When I think about Christmas time, as people call it, I'm really thankful that people remember Jesus' birth. But God wants us to remember more than that. He wants us to see the whole picture. He wants us to see this virgin-born child of His this eternal Word who became flesh. He wants us to understand that His mother was a good, godly woman, that she and Joseph were faithful and they took Him to worship like, like all faithful Jews did, that He grew up in Nazareth. But really, there's very little said about the life of Jesus except when He was in the temple one time until He's 30 years of age. And that's when He began to work. He began to teach. He gave us the beautiful Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7, teaching us how to live as Christians. While the people of God under the Mosaic economy had the law, we have the teaching of Christ. The Sermon on the Mount is the blueprint for Christian living. Jesus came to teach and to share and to give us some idea about how we were supposed to live as Christians. Not only did He come to teach, He came to give us life. But how much life? What did Jesus say in John chapter 10 and verse 10? The thief, 
the thief. He only comes to kill and to steal and to destroy. You know, that's what most people are up to in one form or another. They're out for themselves. Jesus says, but I've come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I feel sorry for people who do not value the life that Jesus has to offer. Because there's no life outside of Christ. There's physical life but there's not one iota of spiritual life outside of Christ. In Ephesians 2 and verse 1, Paul would say to the Christians in Ephesus, you were dead in trespasses and sins. Now he goes on to talk about God making them alive when they became Christians, but before that, they were dead. Everybody outside of Christ is dead spiritually. Jesus said, I've come that they may have life. How much life, Lord? An abundance of life. Until a person has lived the life of a Christian for some time, they cannot grasp the gravity of that statement. Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm still trying to grasp it. I'm still trying to appreciate all the life that's available to me in Christ. But I do know this. If I'm faithful, I'm alive, whether I grasp it all or not. And if I'm faithful, when my body dies, I'll live again forever. That's an abundant life if there ever was one to live eternally with the Lord. But see, Jesus came to give us freedom. Not only are people dead, but they're bound up in sin. And Jesus, would, would there's so much more than sometimes quoting a passage Jesus would tell the Jews in John chapter 8 and verse 32, and you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. How many of us are really successful at guiding our own lives? How are you doing with that? How successful are you spiritually when you try to do it yourself? How successful are you at anything when you try to do it without God? But see, truth, Truth is knowable. It's understandable. Jesus said you can know it and it sets you free. Because sin doesn't do anything except cause us to be in bondage. That little baby who became a man said, let me tell you something. I'm going to make you free from all your troubles. Now, one of these days they'll all be gone, won't they? You'll not deal with them anymore. And even when you have them, I'm going to tell you something. It'll be a lot easier with me because my burden is easy. It's light. It's a lot easier to live for Christ than it is without Him. Freedom. Moral guidance and freedom. Forgiveness. When you're forgiven of your sins, you're free of the guilt and the condemnation of sin. What does it say in Romans chapter 8 and verse 1? There's therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. That's freedom if there ever was. That's freedom if there ever was. But I want you to think just for a few minutes, why did my Savior come to earth? Let's just stop right here for a moment. What do you think about when you think about the birth of Jesus? What comes to your mind? And that's a personal question. Nobody can answer that question that, but you. I think about being thankful that he was born. And I'm thankful that he grew up to be my savior. And I'm thankful that he gave his everything so that I might have everything. What does it mean to you that God would think of man and leave heaven to come here to live among sinful man? What do you think about that? That God would do that? I believe it's Psalm 8. What is man that you're mindful of him? The, the psalmist asked. I mean, you've made him a little lower than the angels. What, what are we that God would think about us? What are you? What am I? Well, the Bible says we're made in the image and the likeness of God in Genesis chapter 1. 
So we have some of God in us. We have a spirit. And I'm going to tell you this. That spirit's precious to God. Your soul, that inner person, is precious to God. That's what the answer is to David's question. What is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you would consider him? Because you and I are precious souls. That's one of the reasons my Savior came to earth is because we were made in the image and the likeness of God. And He wants to save us from our own destruction. I wish more people understood that. How many of you have been in that position and you had to wake up about it? Wait a minute, I'm headed in the wrong direction. And if I keep going, it's going to take me under. And you came to know the Lord and you came to realize He, he came here to eat with sinners. He came here to seek and save, Luke 19, 10, that which was lost. He came here to rescue us from ourselves, Jonathan. Because we can do nothing but take ourselves under. You can't take yourself up. You can't grow spiritually by yourself. And so the Word became flesh. And when He confronts Satan in Matthew chapter 4, He said, let me tell you something, devil adversary, Satan, let me tell you something. Man shall not live by bread alone. You're not going to tempt me with those stones being turned into bread. I have a higher calling and purpose. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And the word came into the world, according to Hebrews chapter 1, that God today speaks to us in His Son. John 6 and verse 63, the words that Jesus spoke are spirit and they are life. What does that mean to you? What does it mean to you that He would come here and live among sinful men? He lived in a realm of perfection. He lived in a realm of perfect peace, sinlessness, no rebellion, there's nothing in heaven. There's no bitterness. There's no anger. There's no hatred. There's no contention. There's no strife. And he left a place where none of that was to come to where all of that was. And how was he treated for it? You have a demon. Who do you think you are? Let us show you who we think you are. So the Jews had a plan got him arrested and got him put to death. What does it mean to you that while on earth Jesus would say, do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword, Matthew 10, 34-39, tells us that it said, you know, a man and his father, they'll be advanced, son and father advanced from one another. Husband and wife, family. A man's foes will be those of his own household. Why? Because some would choose the Lord. He didn't come down here to make everybody happy. He came down here to make peace with certain ones. Man, Romans 5 and verse 1, we have peace with God through Christ Jesus. You won't have peace with everybody. How many of you have uh, unrest and strife with your own family because you're a Christian Christian you belong to the Lord I didn't come here to bring peace people look at this time of year so oh, it's just such a peaceful time of year no it's not not really matter of fact in one of the I love the songs of the season I love to sing some of them I love to hear some of them and and one of the misleading statements is peace on earth, goodwill toward men. Listen to Luke 2.14's account of what was actually said by the angels and the heavenly host at Jesus' birth. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom He is pleased. The people that God is pleased with have peace. Don't you wish that people would move from the manger 
to the cross and live under that cross of life, of dedication, and devotion. Oh, I'm sure a lot of people do this time of year. I'm not saying they don't, but, you know, come the end of next week, there are a lot of people they are going to forget about. Oh, the Christmas songs will stop, and they're going to forget about all of this. We Christians won't forget. We'll live on under not only a Christ that was born of a virgin, but Christ who died, who died for us, gave His life for us. What does it mean to you that Jesus would say in John chapter 3 and verse 14 that the Son of Man would be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness so the Son of Man would be lifted up? What does it mean to you that Jesus would say that. He's talking to Nicodemus in John chapter 3. Nicodemus, I'm a lot more than a man that God is with. I'm someone who's going to be lifted up. In John chapter 12, the, the text talks about that in even more detail. Details in John chapter 12 at verse 32. The Lord said, and if I am lifted up, and I, if I'm lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. While the birth of Jesus was critical and necessary, the drawing power of God was a cross, not a manger scene. The drawing power of God was the Son of God being lifted up, but He was saying this to indicate the kind of death by which He would die. The crowd then answered him, We've heard in the law that the Christ is to remain forever, and how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is the Son of Man? So Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. Yes, we're thankful Jesus was born, but finally Jesus said, let me tell you what the drawing power is. When I'm lifted up, that's when I'll draw all people to myself. And you know what? When a person is drawn to Christ through the cross, they're drawn to Him forever. You see a dying Savior in Luke 9, 23, Jesus would say to them all, if anyone desires to come after Me, let him deny himself and take up His cross daily and follow me. You're not going to forget Jesus in January, are you? You're not going to forget Jesus in February or March. You're going to remember Him all year. Amen. And I think, aren't you thankful for the cross? Why did my Savior come to earth? Because Jesus was born to die. He was born to die and He died so that we might be born again. He was born to die, but He died that we might be born again. So Jesus talks to Nicodemus in John 3. And he says, listen, Nicodemus, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Unless one is born of the water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God of God and that's possible Nicodemus because I'm going to be lifted up I'm going to die for your sins well let me tell you something Nicodemus there's a lot more to me than my miracles these signs I'm a son of God and you need to be born again be thankful for his birth how many of you have experienced the new birth I don't care if you're 99 and a half years old. If you're baptized into Christ, you're born again. Because Jesus died. He was born and died so that you might be. This time of year is so cheerful. But a Christian sings praises to God all year long. Because ultimately, he or she gave themselves to the Christ who died for our sins. Why did my Savior come to earth? So that He might take us to heaven forever.
God came and visited for a little while, some 30 or so years. And he did his job and he did it well. Because he's God. How about you this morning? Would you give your life completely and fully to the Lord by hearing, believing, repenting, confessing Christ, being buried with Him in the water grave of baptism, to be born again? If you're here as a Christian, your life's not been consistent. You're having a hard time answering some of the questions. You need to respond. How about starting the end of the year with a new beginning as we stand and as we sing?